thank you for the uh, opportunity this morning to uh, speak to y'all. I appreciate y'all tuning in. I appreciate the organizers for inviting me to uh, speak this morning. As you can see, I'm going to be covering uh, nitrogen management and cover crops. And for me, when I think about that scenario, I think about, or when I think about that topic, I think about two different scenarios. And I'm gonna to try to go into uh, detail on each of those. Uh, the first is um, when actually applying nitrogen to the cover crop to enhance biomass production. And uh, you know, generally we think about high residue cover crops, and of course this would be for the cereals. And uh, this is, you know, this is an example of what we're talking about. Now, generally the reason we want to fertilize the cover crop is, you know, we're here primarily we're talking about the coastal plain soils, you know, very coarse textured soils. We don't have a lot of nitrates hanging around. We get a lot of nitrogen that's, or excuse me, a lot of rain that's going to leach that nitrogen out. So we just don't, there's not a lot of nitrogen there for the cover crop to take it up. Now, sometimes you can have scenarios if it's like a dry summer and you just haven't got a lot of rain, you could get a situation where there's some nitrogen there. But in general, we, we want to fertilize the cover crops because we're trying to enhance that biomass production. Uh, as we, if we enhance the biomass, we're generally going to enhance the benefits associated with the cover crop. So if, if you think about uh, fertilizing the cover crop and you look at these uh, uh, challenges, questions that growers may have, and this is not an exhaustive list, this is just something that uh, kind of thought about for this presentation, but you've got a time and labor required for fertilizing the cover crop. It's another trip across the field that, you know, growers have got to uh, dedicate someone to be able to go out there and do that. You've also got the question of when you actually fertilize the cover crop, what, what time of year, how much do you apply? You can even get into sources and think about com comparisons between commercial fertilizer and animal manure, for example. And then of course, the, I think the main one is just the cost of fertilizing the cover crop itself. You know, that, that's just an additional cost. So if you take a look at this budget here, this is kind of representative of uh, cereal rye in our experiments. And, you know, of course, I think it's been mentioned, if, if you plant a cover crop, you're going to have an establishment cost and you're going to have a termination cost that, you know, there's just no way around that. Now, you can tweak some of that. For example, you could just rely solely on chemical termination. You don't necessarily have to roll it if you don't want to. Uh, so you can cut a little bit of the, the cost out there. And then as far as establishment, you know, you don't have any control over how much the seed costs, but you certainly can control how much you plant. And there's been work, previous work here recently that uh, has looked at seeding rates and uh, is showing that we might get back seeding rates that we've recommended in the past are certainly not as high as what they have been. So that's going to lower uh, the cost as well, which is obviously a good thing uh, for the growers trying to utilize cover crops. Now for the fertilization, uh, you know, this is just an example that's including 30 pounds of nitrogen, and that's, uh, you know, that's pushing $19 an acre for the, for the cover crop for just 30 pounds. And a lot of times, you know, growers are going to be very tempted to eliminate that cost just because they don't want to spend that kind of money on the cover crop. They're trying to grow it as, as cheaply as they can, uh, which is totally understandable. But, um, you know, I would argue if you're going to grow a cover crop, uh, you need to invest as much into it as you can to maximize the benefits associated with the cover crop so you get a return on the investment that you expect. And a lot of times for us, that's going to include fertilization. And uh, the previous speakers uh, have talked about you know, various benefits associated with cover crops. And you can pick uh, any cover crop, any benefit that you'd like to. And you can take a look at this picture here. You got the fertilizer on the left and no fertilizer on the right. And I, hopefully you would be able to uh, determine which one you think you're going to get the most benefit out of. And I hope it's, you know, I hope that's an obvious um, choice for you. So when you start thinking about fertilizing the cover crop, you know, it, it's obviously a cost that we have to deal with. And we want to try to um, make that as efficient as possible, lower that cost as much as possible for the growers. So when we started looking at fertilizing cover crops, this was several years ago, we started thinking about, you know, where is there sources that we can take advantage of that are just not gonna cost as much money or, or whatever. So of course, one of the things was uh, thinking about peanuts. And, and so um, now this is, this is a picture showing the wind road uh, 
peanut after harvest. And of course, I agree with Joel, you want this spread out, but this is for illustrative purposes. Uh, you can see the darker green colors there on the rye where there's a little bit of growth there. So or a little bit of greener color. So we started looking at this and thinking, well, you know, maybe we could take advantage of uh, following a legume like peanuts and enhance our biomass production. And so we looked obviously at um, different laboratory studies and inc uh, that included incubation studies as well as field studies. And we were really not able to see any benefit following the peanut residue. And this graph here kind of illustrates that for you. You can see um, we have removed, which was basically we raked the peanut residue and baled it, or we just left it in the field following harvest. And this was over a three year period and looked at rye biomass and we just didn't see any real benefit um, where we left the peanut residue. And this has kind of been confirmed with uh, University of Florida, primar primarily Mike Mulvaney and his students have looked at this and they haven't seen uh, a lot of benefit either. Now it's not to say you don't get any nitrogen, it's just you don't seem to get enough that's going to offset um, a fertilizer application cost or on your uh, cover crop. So we also wanted to take a look at uh, poultry litter. And I'm doing this lag here. The, uh, we looked at poultry litter. And in this case, you know, we're comparing it to commercial fertilizer. And you can see, uh, we're, obviously we're surface supplying that, you know, poultry litter is something that we have a lot of access to. Uh, you know, we, most everybody's gonna have uh, somewhere nearby that they probably can get some poultry litter and hopefully they can get it at a, at a good price. So we compared that with commercial fertilizer. We did have to just leave it on the ground. We're dealing with a conservation tillage system here, so we don't want to do any kind of disruptive tillage in the surface there. Now that might have hurt the poultry litter because we could have had some volatilization losses here. Um, you know, and if you were on a place where maybe you had some somewhat of a slope, you could get some runoff. We didn't have any runoff issues in our experiments, but that is a possibility. And so we wanted to take a look at times of application as well as rates between poultry litter and commercial fertilizer. And so I'll show you this figure here, just kind of summarize, looking at the source and timing interaction between commercial fertilizer and poultry litter. And, you know, there's not a lot of difference there that we observed. And when we did see a difference, it tended to favor uh, commercial fertilizer. We saw some benefits for a slight benefit for uh, fall applied versus spring applied. And that kind of laid the groundwork for us as far as looking at uh, more fall applied fertilizer uh, compared to spring. And so, you know, in this case, I would say that uh, it, poultry litter is certainly not going to hurt you as an end source. It, it didn't seem to do as well as commercial fertilizer, but if you have access to it and it's, you know, you can get a good price for it, I, I don't really see anything wrong with using it. Uh, it's just, uh, it didn't seem to perform quite as well as the commercial fertilizer in this particular study. Now, um, when we started thinking about, uh, you know, again, we we're looking at commercial fertilizer applications on rye to enhance biomass. We tried to take advantage of the legume. We looked at different sources. Then we started thinking about, you know, more of a management aspect, not just focusing on commercial fertilizer applications by themselves. We, we know that if we plant a cover crop earlier in the year, we're going to generally have a better biomass production uh, for that cover crop. And so we wanted to take a look at that in conjunction with different nitrogen rates, as well as maybe backing off on some of the seeding rates as well. And so this is a six year experiment. It's actually gonna end this fall when we harvest the cotton. Uh, it's at Headland, Alabama. And uh, let me just show you some of the uh, biomass information for that. Oh, excuse me, I forgot about the seeding rate. I wanted to make this point. Um, you can see there's variability between different seeding rates as far as uh, the amount of biomass produced each year. And this was averaged over all the treatments. Um, but you can see there's no difference between 60 or 90 pounds, which that's obviously good. That's going to help lower that production cost associated with the cover crop. And there's even, like I say, I mentioned some other work that has showed we might even come back off more than that. So that's certainly going to be encouraging uh, to, if we can back off and, and uh, lower the cost, but still maintain the benefits. That's the key thing we have to check and make sure that we're not um, you know, going too far the other way and not have enough biomass production there for the associated benefits. Now, um, if we look at the uh, interaction between the planting dates and nitrogen rates across these six different environments, 
Uh, you can see, uh, let's just look at the first year, the Wiregrass 15 um, up in the top left corner. It, you know, kind of what we would expect, we saw, uh, you know, a very, very high response to uh, nitrogen, and we saw uh, differences between the planting dates. Of course, the earliest planting date performed the best, as we would have expected. Then we came back to this next year in 16, and, and uh, no response at all to nitrogen. We had an extremely wet fall, uh, early winter, and, I, you know, we basically, I think, just lost all the nitrogen that we had applied. Uh, we saw some benefit for the planting date aspect, but not really, uh, you know, not, not nearly as dramatic as what we saw the previous year. 17 was a little bit more normal, uh, I guess, what you would expect. You're starting to see that separation between the two earlier planting dates compared to the last two planting dates. Uh, not, as, not as steep a response to nitrogen for that particular year. And then um, 18, again, saw the separation the first time or the only time that we really saw a, a flip-flop between our second planting date and first planting date, but still had the separation between the, uh, from the first two planting dates compared to the last two. And then this past year in 20, uh, you know, the first two planting dates were essentially the same, but uh, you know, the clear separation between uh, the earlier planting dates compared with the later. So I wanted to show you the variability that we were dealing with across these different environments. And then, of course, you know, when we average all that together, you show this, this, this graph here. Um, you know, again, you, you see the uh, kind of falls out like you'd expect. You see higher biomass for the uh, earliest planted cover crop, and then the second planting date is, is very similar. And then you see a clear separation between um, the last two planting dates. So, you know, as we were conducting this research, a lot of times growers talk about and which I understand, you know, they, they say they have a very hard time planting a cover crop, you know, in the fall and trying to do it in a timely manner. And I certainly understand that with everything that's going on in harvest and so forth. But I try to show this information to see, to let them see what, what could potentially happen. So, for example, if you look at the red line there, if we got somebody that planted in early mid-December, they could have theoretically planted 90 pounds of seed to the acre applied 90 pounds of nitrogen to the acre, and they, they produced about the same level of biomass as the guy that planted in mid-late October that didn't apply any nitrogen. Now, I'm not saying that 3,000 pounds is, a, is a, uh, a large biomass amount, but I certainly, you know, I think everybody can recognize that one costs a lot more money to produce than the other one. So this is what I'm, when uh, I have time to do this, I just want to show information like this so they recognize that they could be costing themselves a lot of potential um, in terms of what that cover crop's going to do for them if they're not trying to manage it in a timely manner. And for example, you know, I know that they have to harvest, but maybe they could be trying to plant in the mornings and harvesting in the afternoons or something like that. Because it's just, you know, it's, it's very costly uh, to use that mentality of like, I'll, I'll get everything harvested, then I'll worry about a cover crop. So um, another thing, and, and Julia touched on the mixtures, I think um, if we take a look at, uh, this is a study uh, from Shorter, Alabama, near Montgomery in central Alabama, where we looked at some different mixtures. These are four-year average biomass values. Um, you can see that we have, on the, on the uh, y-axis, we have rye clover at uh, 30 pounds, rye was planted at 30 pounds the acre and clover at 20. That was our mixture proportion. And then you can see we had fertilized rye and then you can see all the others here uh, broken out. And uh, you know, I don't have statistics on this, but I have, uh, you do have the error bars there. So there are definitely some differences here uh, between these. And these are not just super complicated mixtures. These are just two and three species mixtures uh, that we wanted to try to look at. And um, you can see Let's just focus on the top two bars, the rye clover at 30, 20, and then the fertilized rye. Those are essentially the same. I, I don't think those are gonna be statistically different. One obviously is a little bit uh, numerically superior than the other, but they're, they're not uh, different. So if you're sitting here and you're gonna grow a cover crop, you know, which one of those, which one would you choose to grow if they're essentially producing the same level of biomass? Well, for me, it would come down, I think the first thing most people would say was it would come down to the cost. And this, let's look at this chart here. 
Um, I've got the single species kind of in the blue in the blue bars. We got the two species in the green, and then we have the three species in the more the orange. And you see the seed cost there, and that's associated with the uh, particular seeding rate that was planted. Then we have the total cost, and this all comes from that budget that I talked about at the beginning of the slide. And that, that's going to include your you know, establishment cost as well as your termination cost. And for the rye fertilized, that's going to include uh, that fertilizer cost. None of the other covers were fertilized. We only fertilized the single species of rye. And so what we can do is take that total cost and divide it by the four-year average biomass. That's from that previous graph I just showed you and multiply that times 100, and we get a dollars per 100 pounds of biomass. And it just gives us a kind of a way to normalize these values so they're a little bit easier to uh, compare. So if we look at those two bars that I mentioned to you, the rye fertilized and the rye clover, uh, the first thing, let's look at the total cost there. And, and you can see the clover was a little bit more expensive in that mixture. It worked out to be $5, you know, approximately $5 more than uh, fertilizing the rye. So, you know, but it did produce a little bit higher biomass level on the average compared to the fertilized rye. But the, the cost is essentially the same. You know, they're, one, they're about two cents difference between them. So, uh, you know, now it's like, well, okay, what are we going to use as our decision to, to uh, which one we plant? Well, it, it's really grower preference, to be honest with you. One guy may say, I'd rather just plant a mixture two species mixture and go out and be done with it. Another guy might have not any problem going and saying, oh, I'll just plant rye and I'll just come back and fertilize it. It's no big deal. It, it really depends. Now, obviously this is could change depending on if you applied more nitrogen or if your nitrogen cost goes up compared to clover and rye seed and all that. But um, the other thing, if somebody wants to plant the mixture with the rye clover, and I think, you know, Junior touched on this. If you have a, mixture that has a legume proportion, then you certainly could get some nitrogen benefit on the subsequent crop from that mixture. So uh, that, that leads right into the second aspect that I wanted to talk about regarding um, you know, nitrogen management and cover crops. And my slides are dragging here. Okay, if I just took over, you can just tell me when this advanced. Okay, slide. yeah, next please. Okay, so that, that, that ties into a cover crop is grown to reduce nitrogen requirements for the subsequent cash crop. And obviously a lot of times we think about legumes, you know, a single species legume, but you could think about uh, a mixture as well, certainly one that has a high proportion of legumes in that particular mixture. Next, please. So I wanna describe this study here that uh, we've conducted recently. Uh, it's looking at cover crop mixtures preceding corn. We have five different cover crop treatments. So we have a fallow, we have rye fertilized, kind of our standard cover crop, and then we have a single species of hairy veg at 20 pounds. And then we just had two single species mixtures with a different proportion of veg. We had rye at 30 pounds, and then we included veg at 10 pounds or veg at 20. And the subsequent uh, figures I'm going to show you uh, 10 pounds will refer to mixture one, so, uh, and mixture two is gonna be 20. So the, the two and one, that's how to keep it straight. And then of course we came back and put uh, nitrogen rates out on top of these cover crops uh, at um, normal side dress time. Next, please. Okay, so if we look at the biomass production, we've got five different environments here uh, for, for this uh, test. Um, this includes E.D. Smith and Shorter and then Wiregrass in 18 uh, near at Headland. And you can see, um, you know, in the mo for the most part, the single species uh, vetch was generally the lowest biomass producer uh, compared to the grasses or the, to the, gra to the rye or um, the mixtures. And of course the green bar is rye, that's fertilized rye. And notice how the mixtures themselves, the two mixtures, were, were very comparable, and we didn't put any fertilizer out on those uh, particular cover crops. Next, please. So if we play those same games again and look at the uh, cost here for these four cover crops, um, you can see uh, 
you know, you got the five-year biomass, and we really didn't have any difference between the biomass, between fertilized rye and the two mixtures. And vetch, of course, was a little bit lower. And so based on the cost that we have and the, and the biomass that was produced, you can see our um, average biomass, our cost per 100 pounds of biomass. And that's where you're starting to see some separation between these covers. And you can see vetch is the most expensive at $1.77 compared to these others. But if you are, uh, if your goal, like that was mentioned, I think in, in, by uh, Joel and Julia, if your goal is nitrogen management, you're trying to go grow the cover crop for nitrogen, but then $1.77, even though that's the most expensive one, that may not be you know, expensive at all to you because you're trying to lower your nitrogen requirements for the subsequent crop. Uh, next, please. Um, if you look at end content here uh, of these covers, uh, they kind of shake out what you'd expect. You had the, uh, the veg produce the uh, highest amount of uh, nitrogen. Obviously, it's a pure legume, uh, rye being the lowest. And then you can see the mixtures were, were, were very comparable, not always as high as the veg, but very comparable. Next, please. So we did, um, let's see. If we do, let's back up one. I think it missed, I think it skipped one. Yeah, so like I said, we came in and measured uh, early season cotton biomass. Uh, we didn't put any pre-plant fertilizer, any starter or anything like that out. We wanted it to, the growth to be attributed to the cover crops themselves. And you can see uh, the first year, very responsive. We had really good growth, but no real difference between our treatments. 17, kind of the opposite, very low. Uh, growth and that's just unfortunately we deal with this variability in studies all the time but uh, you can see that in 18 you know you're starting to see some separation the veg is, is uh, the growth of the cotton was a little bit higher for veg and, and even some of the mixtures um, 19 saw the most difference um, you know as you'd expect fallow and rye had the lowest growth for the for the cotton and then 18 we saw uh, really kind of a wash, but they were all better than fallow. Next, please. So if we take a look at the yields across these, uh, you know, the first thing you notice if you look at this response to nitrogen, 90 is the recommended, recommended rate, and it's kind of a flat curve here. So there was some response. If you look at E.B. Smith 16, you can see the vetch and the zero in rate. There was a, a slight uh, boost there, but the most responsive year was 18. And you can see for the mixtures and the veg, we, we got about 2,000 pounds of lint with no nitrogen applied. So, you know, this certainly can occur. The problem is it just doesn't always occur uh, consistently. You have a lot of factors that control this, and it's very difficult. The synchronization of the crop, or synchronization as it breaks down and the uptake of the following crop. Now, there is a way to uh, hopefully eliminate some of this guesswork. Uh, the University of Georgia has a calculator that they promote uh, to look at nitrogen and, and uh, how much nitrogen is actually available for the, from the uh, cover crop and, and how that's going to affect your cash crop. Next, please. And this, this is a demo from uh, the guys at the Plant Material Center in Americas. And this was conducted at the cover crop conference in Auburn last uh, I guess in 2019, summer of 2019. And this kind of highlights that calculator. So basically what we have is different cover crops on the, on the y-axis. And then the blue bar is the, is the yield, seed cotton yield grown with the standard N rate. And then the green bar is what the calculator in, uh, the calculator yield was for um, following the recommendation by Georgia. And the recommendation the calculator provided is written in black. For example, it might be 20 pounds or 30 or 40. So if our recommended rate was 90 pounds, you can see that we were able to reduce that from 50 to 70 pounds of nitrogen, and we still had approximately the same yields. We didn't really see any major yield penalties at all. So this, you know, the calculator worked very well. It kind of highlights the benefits of, of that and how we don't have to necessarily go out and and guess this this is a little bit more scientific. We need to probably give you more detail about the calculator, but I just wanted to highlight how it works. And so I think this is going to conclude my presentation. And I know I'm over my time, but I uh, wanted to give you my contact information. And if if you want to contact me, please do.